So Mendel's model of inheritance really followed certain assumptions. He didn't explore these any further. Um, in fact, when he published his results, he nobody really understood what he was trying to say. And he, if, as far as we can tell, quit doing research in genetics. And he became the abbot of the monastery um, in Birno and died in 1884. And, and it didn't seem that anybody really understood what he was talking about. His, his rules were rediscovered in 1900 by four different groups who had performed similar kinds of experiments. And they then found his research and understood it. But Mendel's model assumed basically that every trait could only be controlled by one gene, which is very simplistic. A lot of traits are controlled by the collective input of multiple genes, not just multiple alleles, but multiple genes on all different chromosomes. And he also had sort of a model where every gene only had two possible alleles, one of them being dominant, one of them being recessive. That's also much um, too simplistic. Um, there are almost always more than two alleles of a gene. And there was always, at least with the traits that he studied, there was always a clear dominant and recessive relationship between those two alleles. So Mendel's model is pretty straightforward, but real genetics, real genes, um, real traits don't follow these rules. So we need to look at some things that we've learned beyond Mendel, extensions of Mendel's model. So in red, I have the extensions. The extensions are, and I'm just giving you like one example of each of these things, so it's really kind of an introduction to this concept. We're not going to go any further than this in this course. But just to give you an idea that um, the way Mendel studied everything isn't, you know, that's not the end of it. So the idea that every trait is controlled by a single gene, not necessarily true. Lots of traits are um, controlled by more than one gene, multiple genes. Sometimes we call them polygenic traits, meaning many genes. And the example we're going to use is the eye color of fruit flies is actually controlled by many genes. Um, one of the genes is on the X chromosome, but there's other genes on, I think there's genes on chromosomes two and three of fruit flies that control eye color. So all of those genes, the alleles of all those genes combined together yields the final color. And I think if you think about even human eye color is more than one gene, even though I've pretended like it's one gene, it really isn't. It's multiple genes. And I think if you think about it, it makes sense because when we say blue eyes, there really isn't just a, a, an exact blue and everybody with blue eyes has that exact same color. There's, there's shades of blue, there's flecks of other things. You know that eye colors are complex, and it makes sense that there's more than one gene involved. Then the idea that any particular gene can only have two alleles, virtually never true. Um, genes have lots of alleles, so we're going to use rabbit fur color as an example. And then this one is particularly bothersome. If you think you know a lot about genetics, I'm going to shatter your dreams here. The idea that there's always a clear dominant and recessive relationship between alleles for the same gene, that is not true um, for a lot of genes. There are some genes that have some pretty simplistic genetics, um, some rules, but there's a lot of genes where it's not that simple and it gets more complex. So we're going to look at incomplete dominance and we're going to look at co-dominance as kind of an introduction to that idea. All right. All right. So more than one gene. We said fly eye color was going to be an example of that. So there are fly eye color genes on the X chromosome, but there are genes on chromosome two and chromosome three. 
And so in the end, you end up with different, a whole bunch of different eye colors that have been identified in fruit flies. And in this picture, clockwise from top, brown, cinnabar, sepia, vermilion, white, and red. But there's lots of others. Uh, I think there's like a hundred different alleles, but that's, that's a whole other different issue. But more than one gene, so genes on chromosome X and genes on chromosome 3 and chromosome 2. All right, and then I give you this question, how many genes control human height? If you think about it, your final height, I'm 5'7", what is that? That's a phenotype, it's something observable and measurable, but it's the sum total of a whole bunch of genes. So maybe I have genes that make my bones grow a little faster than yours or a little bit less than yours. Maybe I have genes that make my metabolism a little faster or slower. Um, so things that, things that influence growth hormones, bones, bone plates, any kind, you know, those types of um, anatomy structures, anatomical structures. So there could be potentially, you know, dozens of genes that could be um, considered to have an, an input on the final number. For me, it's five foot, five foot eight, five foot seven. I'm shrinking a little bit. In my old age, I was once five eight, but now I'm five seven. Um, what about multiple alleles? Meaning for any one gene, and we're going to use rabbits as an example. So for the fur color, um, there's, there's a certain gene on a certain chromosome, but at that position on that chromosome, there's possibility of at least four different alleles. Now any one um, rabbit can only have two of those four alleles. And they've listed them up for you here. The, um, the wild type is the brown allele. They list with a capital C. Then you have the chinchilla allele. They put a lowercase c with a ch. The Himalayan allele they put as a lowercase c with an h. And then the albino allele is just the lowercase c. Now remember, we made up these letter designations just as abbreviations. But So any one um, rabbit can have, you know, could have one of the brown alleles and one of the Himalayan alleles together or one chinchilla allele and one albino allele. Those are possible, but there's four different alleles and any one um, rabbit can have two of those. And it can be two of the same allele as well. All right, so multiple alleles. That's really, really common um, for lots of genes. Incomplete dominance. What we've talked about so far in terms of Mendel, Mendel define dominance as where you have one allele that will show its phenotype and the other allele that we call the recessive is silent. So when you have a heterozygous individual, the dominant allele is the one that you see in the phenotype, so to speak. But And that would be called complete dominance. So incomplete dominance is where you have a heterozygous individual and the phenotype is sort of a combination of those two, or we say it's in between or intermediate between the phenotypes that those two alleles would, would normally um, cause. And so a good example of this is always given in snapdragons, which are flowers, uh, shown here on the far right. A snapdragon can be red, uh, and it's the whole plant. Red plant, a red flowered plant, a white flowered plant, or if you made a homozygous red flowered plant, with a homozygous white flowered plant, when you create the hybrid, the hybrids are not red, they're pink. So it's a distinct in-between red and white phenotype. We call that incomplete dominance. Luckily, Mendel didn't see this in the genes that he looked at in pea plants, because it does, incomplete dominance is looks like blending a little bit. Um, however, when you self-fertilize a pink plant, you will get some plants that are red, some that are pink, and some that are white, showing that the alleles will still segregate back out. So it's not, it's not blending, but it, it initially might look like blending if you um, didn't follow through on all the experiments. And then the last kind of unusual thing here is co-dominance. Codominance is very rare. In fact, I only know examples of codominance in terms of blood antigens, 
and one of the common ones that's usually given is type AB blood because you have there is a, um, a, a gene called the ABO um, blood type locus and you can there's three different alleles A, B, and O and you can only have two of those and so you either have A and A, A and B, A and O, B and B, B and O, or O and O. I think I named them all. Anyway, so the, what's interesting is a person who has A and B, because neither one is dominant over the other. So we don't say that you're, we don't consider that an incomplete dominance. We call it codominance because you are both A and B at the same time. You are two things. You have two dominant traits at the same time. But blood types is the only time codominance seems to ever come up that I'm aware of. So where do alleles come from? A gene is just a sequence of nucleotides on the DNA. And so a gene, in theory, there, have, there has to be like the first gene, like the original eye color gene, whatever that was. It was probably brown. And then a new allele would just be a mutation of an old allele. So somewhere on that gene, if there was a mutation, like in the DNA, like an A got changed to a C or a G got changed to a T, you probably know the A and the C and the G and the T in the DNA. And then that could make a whole new allele just by that one letter change in the DNA. So a new allele is just a mutation of an um, existing allele or an old allele. Now we don't know where the first allele came from. So that, that starts to be a chicken and an egg problem. But at some point when there was an allele that, that all the organisms had, then a new allele would just be a mutation of the original allele. And then at that moment, there are two alleles possible. Typically, we don't worry about new alleles unless they start to become, you know, being passed on to enough individuals in the population that they are um, significantly represented in the group. But anybody could have a new allele. In fact, there are more than just three blood types. A, B, and O are the ones that are the most common. They're the ones that are that people have enough or frequently enough that we, we consider them. But there are other blood types. You could be born with a new blood type that only you have. And maybe you never pass that on. Maybe you never have any children or maybe you don't pass that allele on, but you might have a new allele. We just don't usually worry about it if it's just one person that has it. Um, it might make it hard for you to get a blood transfusion, but in any case. All right, what about X-linked genes? When you talk about a gene being X-linked, all that means is that that gene is located on the X chromosome. It's just the location. In humans, though, the weird thing about the X chromosome is females have two copies of that chromosome where males only have one. So if you're a male, if you inherit a mutant allele on your X chromosome, then that's the only copy of that gene you're going to have. So that's the phenotype that you're going to have because the, the Y chromosome doesn't help you. For females, if you get a mutant allele on one of your Xs, you'll probably have a normal allele on the other X and you'll probably be fine. And so for females, you kind of have, you know, you have a backup. You have two copies of the X. For males, you only have one copy of the X, so whatever you get on that X, you're going to have that phenotype. So it kind of creates some interesting um, patterns. Usually it, it, it results in, it's much more likely for a male to show um, an unusual phenotype for a gene that's located on the X. For a female to show an unusual phenotype, she would have to have inherited a, a mutant allele from her mother's ex and a mutant allele from her father's ex, which is less likely. All right, epistasis, one of my favorites. This picture is mice, but I like to use Labrador retrievers because they follow this rule. In Labrador retrievers, there are three colors, three coat colors, um, black, brown, and yellow. In this picture, these are mice, and they're brown, black, and white, but it doesn't really matter. Um, what happens in laboratory retrievers, and I guess in these mice, is that if you have, um, I'll use the mouse example for, for 
for these purposes. If you have a, a agouti is the brown color of a, of a field mouse, and that's carried on the dominant allele, big A. And then the black allele in mouse is carried on the little a. And then the, um, and, and so you can be big A, big A, that would be agouti, little a, little a, that would be black. But then there's another gene, C, which is on a different chromosome. So it's a second gene. So you have the gene A, which has two alleles, brown and black. And then you have this gene C. The dominant allele for gene C means that you will have a color displayed on the fur. But the lowercase c, the recessive allele for c, is kind of albino, no color. And so if you have an individual, a mouse that's little c, little c, what happens is right here, right here, right here, right here, is that you, it doesn't matter what's on the a allele, little c, little c blocks every, any other color. So even though this one's big A, big A, which should be brown, it's also little c, little c, and little c, little c overrides big A, big A. Little c, little c overrides big A, little a, big A, little a. It's like, it's like none of that matters. If you have a little c, little c, it blocks the A allele, the expression of the A. So that's called epistasis. Epistasis is where one genotype blocks another genotype. It's not one allele and another allele, where one allele is dominant over the other allele. It's where one genotype is sort of dominant or blocks another genotype. Interesting, isn't it? Lethal alleles are exactly what they sound like. There are certain genotypes for certain genes that if you get them, it will kill you. The example they've given you is Huntington's disease. Um, although Huntington's disease usually doesn't kill you until you're um, elderly anyway, but um, there are lethal alleles that will kill um, embryos. And so I think those are kind of more interesting. Um, but in any case, a lethal allele, can, that term can be used to describe an allele that if you if you have it, now if it's a dominant allele, you only have to have one of them. If it's a recessive allele, you'd have to have two, but that could, in certain genotypes, kill, result in your death. And the last thing that's gonna be probably surprising to you is this slide. Normal alleles are not always dominant alleles. Sometimes they are, sometimes they aren't. So on this chart here, Traits that are carried on the dominant allele. Achondroplasia, that's dwarfism. Uh, brachydactyly is a bent finger, like a wrist, severe, like, actually, is it thumb or is it pinky? It might be pinky. Anyway, it's a, it's a severely bent finger, but still five fingers. The other thing that's dominant is polydactyly, which is having six fingers. That's a dominant allele. It's just not very common in the population. Most people don't have that dominant allele. We're pretty much recessive for, for that, so we don't have it, but there, it is a dominant allele. So it, having a dominant, dominant alleles are not necessarily the most common. I guess that's another misconception, um, that the dominant allele is, um, has to be the most common allele. Sometimes that's true, but not, it's not necessarily true. So achondroplasia is the dominant allele, but most of us don't have dwarfism. So Marfan syndrome, that's a heart defect. Neurofibromatosis, widow's peak, that's just a trait in your hair. Wooly hair, that's a trait in your hair. Um, so some of these are, you know, traits. Some of them are diseases. Albinism, that's on the recessive allele. Cystic fibrosis, muscular dystrophy, galactosemia, phenylketonuria sickle cell anemia and Tay-Sachs disease. So what I'm saying is that, especially for the dominant traits, it's important to recognize that unusual traits can be carried on a dominant allele. For some, they are. For some, the, the trait is carried on the recessive allele, so you can't make any assumption about it. I think that's important. And then there's linkage. Linkage just means um, 
the, G, the chromosome to which a gene is, is, well, where the gene is located. So if we have genes A, B, and C, and this is chromosome 3, and this is the other copy of chromosome 3, then you could say that genes A, B, and C are linked on chromosome 3. And you can also say that gene A is linked to gene B and gene B is linked to gene C. It just means close together on the same chromosome. All right. So when genes are linked, they will tend to assort together in meiosis. In other words, if this was the layout of our two homologous chromosomes, this right here, if there was no crossover, then most of your gametes would either get a big A, big B, big C, or a little a, little b, little c. That would be most likely. If there was a crossover, that would be the only way that you would get a slightly different combination. All right.